Good evening, everyone. Come on in. Take your seats, please. We want to welcome you to the first of our Holy Week services in 2024. And we're hoping you can also join us for Easter breakfast at 9 a.m. and service to follow at 1030 on Sunday. While most of us remember only with our minds, for Jewish believers, remembering always leads to action. There's a Hebrew word for remember or memory. It's called zakar, which means more than just bringing something to mind. To zakar is to use your hands, your feet, your lips, or whatever is required 
to bring action to that memory. Whenever God remembers in the Bible, he always follows up with an action. When God remembered Noah, he sent wind to save the inhabitants of the ark. When he remembered Rachel, he enabled her to conceive. And Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me. To remember is to act. There are between three and 7,000, give or take a few, promises in our Bible. And if we resolve to zakar these promises with action, we will remember him well. Would you please stand as we remember Christ's sacrifice for us on this day? <coughs>
darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. This darkness lasted for three hours, from the time Jesus was crucified until the moment of his death. This darkening of the skies expressed the agony and the grief of heaven over the death of Jesus Christ. The darkness at Calvary was an announcement that God's beloved Son was giving his life for the sins of the world. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Jesus uttered with a loud cry and breathed his last breath. Good evening. I'm Kevin Gallagher, the associate pastor here, and I'm so honored to, to be here. Uh, tonight we are celebrating Good Friday. Sorry, I apologize. Uh, if you don't know what Good Friday is, Good Friday is uh, the, the time where we commemorate everything that is involved in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ's death. Uh, Pastor Alex and I will be reading from and teaching from the account in Mark. Uh, we'll be breaking up into two sections, the dark hours and dying words and the decisive events or things that happened after the death of Jesus. So if you have your Bibles, you can open up to Mark 15, 33 to 39. That's going to be the whole passage for the night. So let's start reading. Uh, tonight I'm going to be going over Mark 15, 33 to 37. So Mark 15, 33. And when the sixth hour had come, there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lemma sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And some of the bystanders hearing it said, behold, he is calling Elijah. And someone ran and filled with a sponge with sour wine, put it on a reed, and gave it to him to drink, saying, wait, let us see whether Elijah will come to take him down. And Jesus uttered a loud cry and breathed his last breath. I'm going to walk through this passage verse by verse, and then at the very end, I'll leave you off with some encouragement. So right from the beginning, let's go. Verse 33, Mark says, there was darkness that covered the whole land. This darkness lasted for about three hours. And honestly, as the video mentioned, this is, a, this is an expression of the pain and the grief from the heavens above over the death of the Son of God, Jesus. This was a sign to the whole world that this man, Jesus, who was perfect and blameless, who's dying on the cross for sins he didn't commit, for a crime he didn't commit, that he's about to die. And tonight, just like heaven, we want to share in the pain and grief of Jesus dying on the cross for our sins. Verse 34, Mark says that Jesus said, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And now we're moving to the end of the darkness where Jesus is crying out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Now there was, uh, it's the, there's the famous seven last statements of Jesus, but in Mark's account, we only have this one. But this passage tells us a couple things that are very important about Jesus Christ. The very first one is that this is a fulfillment of prophecy that Jesus himself is the promised Messiah and he came to fulfill many, many prophecies and this statement alone also fulfills another one. He's quoting Psalm 22, 1 where the psalmist writes, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And if you were to open up your Bible when you get home, not necessarily now, to Psalm 22, you can see at the beginning there's despair, that there's grief, that there seems to be no hope. But as you continue reading, there is hope. At the very end of Psalm 22, there's darkness and despair, but
But at the very end of Psalm 22, there's hope and an acknowledgement that God is in control, that he has dominion over the whole world. But here's the thing. Jesus didn't quote the end. He only quoted the beginning at this time. So let us not pass over the pain and the suffering of, of Jesus dying on the cross for our sins. But I believe that he said this to point towards that there is a hope, that yes, right now he's dying and he's suffering on the cross, but he's pointing towards an encouragement. He's pointing towards hope. The second thing about the statement of, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me, that we see. Jesus is saying this because he's experiencing the full wrath of God. You know, if, you, if you've been a believer long enough, you understand that sin is what separates you from God. And for you to be able to go to heaven, somebody has to pay for your sins. Aren't we thankful for, for an amazing Savior, Jesus Christ, to take the wrath of God for us so that we can have the opportunity to have peace with God? In that moment, he's crying out because he feels all of the weight of the sins of the world on his shoulders, past, present, and future. Oh, what a Savior we have, that he took all of that for us so that everybody here in this room could place faith in him and have eternal life and peace with God. Because without him, we should suffer the wrath of God. But thankfully, he willingly took that sacrifice for us. Let's continue reading. Verse 35 to 36, we see, the, we see bystanders say this. Behold, he is calling Elijah. Wait, let us see whether Elijah will come to take him down. Now, if you know anything about Elijah, he was foretold to be coming before the Messiah, the voice crying out in the wilderness. Well, that's not the only thing about Elijah in tradition. The other tradition is, is that he was a deliverer. And so there's a couple things that potentially are happening here when the bystanders are saying, look, he's calling out Elijah. Because Eloi, Eloi he, they, they believe he may be calling out to Elijah himself. So some of the bystanders could be there saying, oh, well, let's see. Maybe Elijah will take him off of the cross. Maybe he will come. Because at this point, people are telling him, if you are the son of God, take yourself off of the cross. So some of them are, are waiting and seeing, oh, maybe. That's one option of why they said that. The other option is what I believe actually happened based off of all the surrounding context of, of all the accounts of Jesus' death. I believe they're mocking him. I believe they're taking this past, this tradition of Elijah coming to be a deliverer and saying, oh, well, if you really are, he's going to come and save you. But he's not. They were mocking him. They were scoffing at him. They were laughing at him. But here's the thing. Proverbs has some things to say about scoffers. Proverbs 21, 24 says this. Scoffer is the name of the arrogant, haughty man who acts with arrogant pride. So a scoffer is someone filled with pride, someone that is haughty. And another famous Proverbs talks about pride. Proverbs 16, 18. Pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. They mocked and scoffed our Lord. But we know that those who mock and scoff are filled with pride and that pride comes before destruction in the fall. Ultimately, they were being influenced by evil to scoff at our Lord. Verse 37, after he cries out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He then uttered a loud cry and breathed his last breath in verse 37. After six hours of excruciating pain, and torture, he let out a cry and he died. He endured a lot for us. Six trials where he was mocked and beaten. He was stripped and he was whipped. He had a crown of thorns jammed into his head. He had to bear his own cross for a, around a half a mile. Then he had to suffer while people are hammering nails into his hands and to his feet. All of this is being done the, uh, during the hottest point of the day. He is suffering. But 
he has enough energy and willpower to cry out, mainly because he's in control. Let us not ever forget that Jesus died not because he's out of control. He died because he's in control. He doesn't die the typical crucifixion death. People want to be able to cry, cry out at this point. But good thing he's not just human, he's God. He's our Messiah. He's able to cry out and breathe his last breath. We see this loud cry and statement to be a shout of victory, to be a shout of triumph. He achieved his mission to be the willing sacrifice on the cross for our sins, for your sins, for my sins. This was not a moment of weakness, as some may scoffingly say. It's not a moment of despair. But this was a victory over evil, a victory over our enemy, the devil himself. So darkness hits the land. Jesus cries out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? People mock him, see if Elijah is going to save him. They're egging him to take himself off of the cross. And then he cries out a loud cry and he breathes his last breath. It's hard to think about. But even though this short passage describing the death of Jesus can be hard to to read sometimes, especially during this season, we do gather some encouragement from it, though. And that's what I want to leave you off with tonight. Three encouragements from this passage. The first one is this. Even though there was darkness that cast it all over the whole land, the light never faded. The light never faded. Jesus calls himself the light of the world in John 8, 12. The darkness covered the whole land, but this darkness cannot overtake the light of the world, Jesus Christ. And because of that, neither do we have to be overtaken by the darkness of this world. Because Jesus says in that same passage in eight twelve, he ends with this. Anyone who follows him, the light of the world, will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Do you tonight have the light in your life? Are you following the one who will illuminate your path, give you direction, give you salvation, give you peace with God? Darkness covered the whole land that day, and it covers us because of our sin. But when we place our faith in the one who can be crucified in the dark and still shine, we can rest assured that we can now walk in a path that is lit up by Jesus, the light of the world. So the light never faded. The second encouragement I want to give you tonight is that Jesus reigns victorious over death. He was mocked. He was scoffed. The people around him, even the devil himself, thought he won. And when the the bystanders were telling telling him, "Take, take yourself off the cross, but that's not exactly what happened, and he died, I bet they believed that they won. And I bet the devil believed that he won. But ultimately... Sunday's coming. And Jesus does, he does reign over victory. He, I mean, over death. He reigns victorious over sin and death because he truly is the son of God. He truly is God incarnate. So that's the second encouragement. Jesus reigns victorious over death. And the third one is this. Jesus' final moments He cried out so that we can cry out. He cried out so that we can cry out. Before he died on the cross for our sins, we had to depend on the law for salvation, which none of us can achieve. But because of that day, when he cried out and breathed his last breath, his mission was accomplished, allowing us to have an opportunity to cry out to him for salvation. Before we cry out to him and before we place our faith in him, we are enemies of him. And he gives us this opportunity to cry out to him. He's giving you the opportunity to cry out to him tonight. Tonight is a night where we seriously reflect on the willing sacrifice that Jesus made for us by dying a death that he didn't deserve for a crime that he didn't commit. He willingly took that pain and that torture for us 
Because with his death, we can have life. Tonight, let's not only reflect on the death of our Lord, but celebrate this one simple fact that Jesus accomplished his mission. Do not leave tonight in despair or grief, for our Lord Jesus came and accomplished his mission on the cross. And for that, I am, and you should be, and we all should be, eternally grateful. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we come before you tonight to, to celebrate this moment. God, we, we thank you for sending your son, Jesus Christ, to, to die on the cross for our sin. He died a, a death that he didn't deserve for a crime he didn't commit, for sins that he didn't commit. But Lord, it was an act of love, and we thank you for that very fact. We know that with his death, we can see victory. That with his death, we can see eternal life. That with, with his death, we can see peace with you. So ultimately, Lord, we're so thankful for that high act of love that you've given us. Lord, we praise you, we love you. In your son's name, amen. <clears throat>
Jesus, thank you for your grace. We could say it a million times, and it would never be enough. It means everything to us. It's life and hope and joy and freedom. Your grace is our strength, our song, and our victory. Thank you for your amazing grace. This anchor for my soul this everlasting hope, the grace on which I stand. It's where my life begins, my future held within, your grace on which I stand. Oh, this grace on which I stand,
curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The curtain of the temple separating the holy place from the most holy place was torn from top to bottom by the hand of God. This signifies that through Jesus' death on the cross, all people now have direct access to God. And when the centurion who stood facing him saw that in this way he breathed his last, he said, truly, this man is the son of God. The Roman centurion who witnessed everything Jesus endured on the cross was deeply moved by the way Jesus died. He proclaimed, surely this man was the son of God. Jesus' death transformed those around him, even a Roman soldier who had never seen anyone die like Jesus did. The centurion's declaration affirms Jesus as the son of God, even in death. Thanks to the Next Gen and Pastor Kevin for putting together the videos for tonight. Um, our theme that we're working our way through, we now come to decisive events as we're looking in Mark chapter 15. And I'm going to focus in on uh, verse 38, but let me read to you both verse 38 and 39 from Mark chapter 15. So far we've seen dark hours and we've seen dying words, but now we want to see uh, decisive events. The curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And when the centurion who stood there in front of Jesus saw how he died, he said, surely this man was the son of God. This evening, just in a short reflection, I want to think with you about that one verse there in Mark chapter 15, verse 38. The curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. No doubt this uh, curtain that's spoken about here is the curtain separating the holy place from the most holy place, or the holy of holies. Um, it was about 60 feet high and about 30 feet wide. The veil was made of finely twisted linen, according to Exodus 26, verse 31, and it was a fine grade of linen. The curtains were violet, um, or like a blue-purple, a darker purple compared to lighter purple, and this color was occasionally thought to be the color of the sky. And, and, and I found this an amazing fact. The color required 12,000 snails to yield only 1.4 grams of pure dye. And that's how the curtain was, was made. And it was this curtain that stood within the temple area in the place where only the priests could go and offer sacrifices. And it was a curtain that kept the holy place where the priests would offer sacrifice from the most holy place, or the holy of holies, where only the high priest could go in once a year and offer sacrifices on the Day of Atonement. I believe it's this curtain the curtain that separated the holy from the most holy place that was torn in two from top to bottom. Both Mark, Matthew, and Luke all claim this fact. And I want you to notice two things. It says it was torn in two. Doesn't mean there was a little tear. Have you ever had a little tear on some clothing and you try and hide it? There's a little bit of a rip. No, this is like torn in two. From top to bottom, to emphasize that this was a miracle and this was by God's hand. It's as if God reached down from the sky and tore it himself. That's the emphasis here in that text. So, so why do the gospel writers emphasize this? Here's what I think they're emphasizing. When Jesus died... The temple curtain was torn in two. Not only was it a physical tearing, it was, and we'll, we'll mention that just a little bit more, it was a physical, a real tearing, but it was ultimately a spiritual tearing. It was a breaking down the dividing wall between sinners and a holy God. That's the most important thing to understand about this decisive event. But I just do want to em emphasize again the physicality of this. The temple curtain was torn from top to bottom. And in Matthew's gospel, he adds this, this statement. The earth shook. The rock split. 
actually think what was happening here is when Jesus breathed his last breath and Pastor Kevin had described how there was darkness covering the earth. After he breathed his last breath, I believe the earth shook. I believe there was an earthquake happening in that region. And perhaps that's part of what God used to bring the temple curtain down. Matthew ties the two together very closely. Ultimately, God can use any means that he wants to accomplish his will. Um, and all of this was going on. Decisive events are happening. But let me just ask you a question. Is this hyperbole that the temple was, the curtain was torn? Or do we really believe it was torn? Well, the gospel writers are writing real history. And they're telling us what they really believed and reporting what they heard happened. But you might ask, how did the gospel writers know? If, if only the priests could go into this mis, you know, holy place, how would, they, how would they know? There's one clue found in Acts chapter 6, verse 7. Very early on, after Jesus died on the cross, rose from the dead, and the church was started, it says about the early church that the word of God spread, the number of disciples in Jerusalem increased lap, rapidly, and a large number of priests became obedient to the faith. I think some of those priests witnessed that event or the aftermath of it. What do we do? The temple curtain is torn. And a lot of them put all these events together and said, one plus one plus one. I mean, this, this is the Messiah. And they put their faith in Jesus Christ. Um, ultimately, I believe that God was signaling in a very physical way the end of the temple sacrificial system. Now, Jesus had predicted that, hadn't he? If you look uh, at Jesus' own predictions, um, he stated that very clearly in Mark chapter 13. Do you see all these buildings, replied Jesus? Not one stone will be left upon another. They will all be thrown down. What God began to do through the tearing of the curtain in A.D. 30 or A.D. 30 depending on your timing of the, the Lord's death, he completed, he made the sacrificial system that he himself had established obsolete by the year A.D. 70. Because in that day, the Roman, Roman soldiers came in and sacked the city and destroyed the temple and burnt it to the ground and there was not one stone left upon another. A mere 37 years after the temple curtain was torn in two, the entire temple was made obsolete. Since that point, there's been no sacrifices according to the old covenant system. God was signaling on the day that Jesus died, this is going to happen. Jesus' words made that clear. And in the end, God brought about the end of the sacrificial system. Why did he do that? Because it was signaling there was a whole new way happening it was not just a physical tearing, but a spiritual tearing that was happening. You see, you have to understand, in the Old Testament, the reason there was a veil, according to Exodus chapter 26, verse 33, is the veil shall be a divider for you between the holy place and the most holy. A sinner could not enter into the most holy place. Only one designated sinner who made atonement for himself went into the, into the most holy place and sprinkled the blood of the, of the bull and the goat upon the altar to, sac to make sacrifice. Only once a year could he go in and do that. And if he did it wrong or if he did it out of, uh, in the wrong way, he himself could even die. The veil kept sinners out of the presence of the holy God. But the veil now was torn, physically torn. But there was a spiritual rupturing of all of this. The tearing of this curtain shows us that God has opened a new way for us to approach Him directly. The new covenant, we have direct access to God. There's no longer any limitations on anyone who can enter into the presence of God now. Why? Because Jesus Christ Himself paved the way, and tore the curtain so that now all can enter. We see that very clearly in the book of Hebrews. The, the writer of Hebrews is a 
Jewish Christian who came to faith in Jesus Christ as Messiah and, and helps us understand the connections between the Old Covenant and the New Covenant, between something like a temple curtain and how that figures our life and our relationship today. And let me just share with you briefly what the writer of Hebrews says about this tearing of the, of the temple curtain and how it relates to you and me today. Here's what he says. I'm reading from Hebrews chapter 10, beginning in verse 1. The law is only a shadow of the good things that are coming, not the realities themselves. For this reason, it can never by the same sacrifices repeated endlessly year after year make perfect those who draw near to God. Otherwise, would they not have stopped being offered? For the worshipers would have been cleansed once and for all, would no longer have guilt for their sins. But those sacrifices are an annual reminder of sins. It's impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. But those sacrifices are an annual reminder. The writer of Hebrews is telling us the sacrificial system was never set up to abolish sin by itself. The sacrifices were just pointing us to a remembrance of our sin, and to the ultimate one who would take away our sins. It was never meant to be permanent anyway. And Jesus' death on the cross made that obsolete. In verse 9, the writer of Hebrews says, Then he, speaking of Jesus, said, Here I am, I have come to do your will. He, Jesus, sets aside the first, the first covenant, the first order of sacrifices, he sets aside the first to establish the second. And by that will, we have been made holy through the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ once and for all. Day after day, every priest stands and performs his religious duties. Again and again, he offers the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But when this priest, Jesus Christ on the cross, when this priest had offered for all time one sacrifice for sin, he sat down at the right hand of God. And since that time, he waits for his enemies to be made his footstool. For by one sacrifice, he has made perfect forever those who are being made holy. Do you, do you see the emphasis on the words? One sacrifice forever. Jesus' death on the cross is the final statement of God about our sins. It's the final payment for our sins. It's once and for all, it's sufficient for all of us who would believe. And then notice what the writer of Hebrews says in verse 19 of chapter 10. Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter, where? The most holy place. By the blood of Jesus. By a new and living way opened for us through the curtain, that is, His body. And since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God with sincere heart and, with full, and the full assurance that faith brings, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. Do you see where the writer of Hebrews tells us to enter? What place? The most holy place. But in the old covenant, only the priest could go in there and only once a year. But now, in the New Covenant, because the veil, the temple veil, the curtain has been torn wide open, there is access for everyone. Everyone can enter. And how can we enter, you ask? Good question. Here's the answer. By a new and living way. What's that new and living way? through the very body and blood of Jesus. So the writer of Hebrews says there's a new curtain. And that curtain is none other than Jesus Christ himself. And his body was torn for us, opening the way for us to go into God's throne and to, receive, to be received by him through faith in Jesus Christ. This is the promise of Good Friday. Everyone who puts their faith and trust in Jesus Christ through His death on the cross for us, can enter into and experience the very presence of God. There is no dividing wall keeping us any longer. The only thing that keeps us from experiencing this is our unbelief. 
is our unwillingness to embrace Jesus Christ for ourselves, to experience His forgiveness, to let the blood of Jesus cleanse us from all sins. But if we would trust in the once and for all sacrifice, the Bible says we will forever be made right with God and we will be able to enter into the most holy place and experience the very presence of God for ourselves because Jesus has made the way. I love the way uh, the great pastor, Baptist pastor, Charles Spurgeon said, when Jesus died on the cross, the veil in the temple was torn from top to bottom so that big sinners like me might fit through. <laughs> I, I need a big way. I, I, you know, we, we, we gotta, there's a way in which we've got to go. And God has to open that way for us. Do you believe that God has opened the way for you to experience His presence and His blessing and His power in your life, the forgiveness of your sins? It is only by that one sacrifice, dark hours, dying words, decisive events, all allow us to enter into the very presence of God tonight. And I encourage you, to receive that gift and to experience the blessing of knowing God in a personal way through Jesus Christ. As I pray, the worship team will make their way up for our final song. Would you pray with me? Gracious God and Heavenly Father, we come to you today in the name of Jesus Christ by whose body that was torn in two and asunder by its sacrifice has made a way for us to experience a relationship with God, with you, our Father. We thank you that Jesus has made the way and that he now stands ready to receive us uh, as he intercedes for us as our great high priest. He prays for us and intercedes for us. He did not only die, He rose from the dead. And so, Father, I pray that we would experience the reality of, of the benefits of what Jesus has done for us and by faith put our trust in Him and in Him alone and in His sacrifice alone. And in doing so, Lord, usher us in by Your Spirit into the presence of the most holy God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Would you stand to make this your claim? Put your faith into action tonight. Say